the fire within podcast you need a sustainable plan the right mindset and the knowledge and inspiration to stoke the fire within just like the phoenix you can burn your old habits never turn back and emerge completely anew there are no shortcuts welcome fire with a nation this is the fire within podcast where we talk about all things nutrition fitness and health related i'm your host brandon woolley joined by my co-host joe hello and today our guest is lily ward hi how's it going Good. How are you? I'm golden. I'm excited about today's episode because we just released an episode on microbiome health. Yes, I just listened to it yesterday. Just by happenstance, you, you had this amazing post kind of about your journey. I'm really excited to talk about it. I, I love making people feel seen and comfortable because everyone goes through things like this. Everyone gets really bad acne or have problems with their gut and then don't know what's happening. And I was completely naive when all of this stuff first started happening to me. I had no idea. It was back in 2016. I was dating a personal trainer that we used to work with. (laughs) And yeah, yeah, he's he's great. Still love him. Good people. And we were doing a cut. I think we were carb cycling. I was really focused on my macros. I was hitting my numbers every single day, but I was working a really stressful job. So a lot of the times I was just focused on numbers and I wasn't focused on food at all. To hit them, I would be drinking just straight up whey protein two or three times a day just to make sure I got my numbers in. My meals were eggs, chicken, rice. You know, I had no other like food because I, that's what I thought mattered was hitting your numbers and your macros and that's how you would be healthy. I just started getting this horrible, awful hormonal acne. Not, I shouldn't say hormonal. I should say cystic. That's what I meant to say. It was just The kind that is so deep and painful and it would like bleed. They're not like normal, like whitehead or blackhead pimples. And I couldn't figure it out. I was like, this is the healthiest I've ever been. I'm working out every day. I'm hitting my numbers every day. And I thought it was stress. I thought it was my job. I went to see a dermatologist and they immediately, they wanted to put me on Accutane. They're like, oh yeah, here, we'll just put you on this crazy antibiotic. Give me a, a book that was like, 50 pages thick on everything, like all the health issues that you could get from Accutane and all the facts. Yeah. So I was talking to my family about it. My aunt, my cousin had been on it before and she was like, don't, please don't do that. She's like, come see an esthetician that I go to see. And I went and I talked with her and she asked me first thing right off the bat. She's like, do you ever drink whey protein? And I was like, all the time. (laughs) (laughs) And she goes, that is, could very well, very well be what's causing it because I see that in clients on a day-to-day basis. They have no idea, but it's the extreme influx of dairy that you're consuming. It just is horrible for your skin. I immediately stopped drinking whey protein. I didn't cut all dairy out of my life. I would still have cheese. I was a sucker for cheese. <laughs> we all are. But as soon as I cut out whey protein alone, my skin stopped breaking out. I didn't have any active acne after that. And I was doing like, I was cleaning my face way more than, you know, normal. And I bought a lot more products for that. But I stopped having gut issues. I stopped, and unless I ate cheese. Like the day I eat cheese, you know, I would always notice my stomach was so upset. So I knew dairy was an issue for me. But I was left with like horrible scarring on my face. And I had to do treatments for it. It was so awful. And that really just started my whole, like, change of mind frame on health. I was like, I'm not even eating, like, food. I'm not eating vegetables. I'm not eating fruits. All I'm eating is chicken protein, rice. And that's it. Yeah. There's no diversity. And and, and those, the fibers, especially from vegetables, they help to rebuild that microbiome. And, yeah. And uh, usually it's it's when things penetrate that lining of the small intestines, that part of your microbiome health, that we start seeing skin issues like the dairy protein, proteins, casein. Yep. Now, I, you know, I always see these really big bulky guys. You know, I used to spend 60, 70 hours in a gym a week when I was a trainer, and they just have like craters all over their body. And, and, I, and I'd always wonder about that. And That's the horrible cystic acne. That's what happened to my face. I had the craters like I remember. Yeah, it yeah. was it was bad. I never tied it to dairy or, or to whey. Now later, as I learned more about nutrition, but and then a lot of the other trainers would say, "Oh, it must be steroids. Steroids must be causing." No, it's yep. the whey. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tell people that at the gym every day. People are like, "Oh my God, your skin has cleared up so much. What do you do?" I'm like, "Stop drinking whey protein." Like, <laughs> I'm actually vegan now. 
that was a result of my whole journey on gut health. I just wanted to cut all the crap out of my life. I eat so many vegetables now, beans, lentils, everything. But I'm not going to tell people, hey, go vegan and clear your skin up. But I tell everyone, I'm like, stop drinking whey protein. If you do anything, yeah. stop that. And that's usually the, the top product that's pushed. I think it's it does give you great results for muscle gain. Yep. But hormonally, I think it could be a nightmare for a lot of people. What is right. whey? It's a broken down form of uh, dairy protein uh, from usually from cow's milk. Really There's like, vegan protein right uh, now too. I saw that. At yeah, the vegan protein's great as long as it's not soy based. Uh, so typically it's like a pea protein, uh, but I try and stay away from soy based protein. But based on you know how that way is produced or, or how sensitive your body is to it, I don't think it's great for everybody. Uh, there might be a small population that does just fine on it. Uh, but even bodybuilders were joke about like whey protein farts and how terrible it is at, at going to a competition. Oh God. Um, yeah. Like getting off the elevator after uh, one of these bodybuilder guys getting ready for a competition. It's just horrible. And they're drinking so much of it. Like I know at the time when I was just trying to hit my numbers, probably half of my calories were coming now, just from whey protein alone. Anywhere I've worked, it's, it's basically what they pushed. After I started learning about nutrition, I'd switched all my clients off away. Uh, so I like collagen. I love collagen, which I don't know if that quite follows a vegan diet. If not, at least find a plant-based one. Uh, what do you drink now? I do pea protein. Pea protein? Um, I have tried different proteins. I've tried a hemp protein. I've done pea protein. I've never actually done soy because I've always just avoided soy proteins. And I really don't see a lot of them out there either. At the time when I cut way out of my diet, I was doing collagen because I wasn't vegan yet. And that's, it's non-dairy, but it is an animal product. So I did that for a while and that was good. I was totally fine. Didn't have any reactions to that. But now I stick to pea protein. Do you have a couple of favorite brands or anything that you stick to? There's a brand called Vegan Smart. I actually know the guy that started the company. I met him in Wilmington. He's fantastic. He's been vegan like his entire life. I mean, it's some of the best vegan protein that I've tried because that's what you hear when you when people are like, oh, I will never drink vegan protein because that stuff is nasty. Like, <laughs> I won't drink it. It's grainy. It's terrible. Lifetime brand is actually not bad. Yeah. Um, um, so I'll do that one. I think that's probably the highest quality proteins I found is, is what they carry. Yeah. And then I also like Brendan Brazier's line, Vega. Um, okay. I'm actually not a big fan of the taste of Vega. I've had it yeah. and it's fine. It's just... Well, I found there's like six different types. He's got the, uh, he's got like the Vegas Sport. He's got just the regular kind of uses as a supplement. And then he's got one with MCT oil in it. Um, and they all taste a little bit different, mm -hmm. but, but some of them I found to be pretty palatable. Yeah. I guess um, I haven't tried that many of those. When I find something I like, I stick to it usually. So we know a little bit about what was going on with your skin and we were able to tie it to whey. Can, can we back up? And what started this kind of motivation for you to get into the gym? Like I've seen you in the squat racks and doing uh, stuff you don't typically expect, uh, especially a woman to do. Yeah. And on that notion, you know, I know you're an advocate for women's rights and, and our perception uh, of what women could or should do. So tell us a little bit what got you into that. I started working at Lifetime Fitness when I was 17. I had just come from working at Chick-fil-A where I gained 10 pounds working at Chick-fil-A oh. because I ate Chick-fil-A twice a day. I would eat one, you get one free meal on your shift. And then when I got off work, I was exhausted and I didn't want to go home and cook. So I would eat more Chick-fil-A. So I started working at the gym and I just really wanted to get fit. And I had a horrible perception of fitness. I was like, I just want to like be toned. I just want to like run. You know how most women yeah. think and I think working there and getting to know the trainers and the people in the environment when you're when you're there, it's so encouraging to learn more and do more. And then I started getting stronger and it felt amazing. I was like, God, I just want to be as strong as I can. I want to do all the lifts. I'm like, what are they doing over there? I want to do that. I want to be as athletic as this. So it became more about like athleticism and strength than it did just active. Yeah, one of the most common misconceptions I think is, well, if I do those types of lifts, I'm going to look like a bodybuilder. Right. Um, which isn't the case. You know, I, th I think you can be, still have all the feminine qualities you want, still be sexy and pretty and w without bulking up necessarily, unless you want to do that. And that's fine. Yeah. And um, I tell people that all the time. I'm like, it is hard to get bulky. It's hard to put on weight. You're not going to go to the gym and do a squat and, or do bicep curls and your arms aren't going to blow up. I yeah. hear that from women all the time when people want to come to the gym with me. They're like, well, I don't really want to like do anything weights though. Cause I don't want to get too big. I'm like, 
it won't happen. Yeah. <laughs> like you got to do a lot of work to yeah. do that. I find that misconception so funny. Like there's a there's this population of accidental bodybuilders out there somewhere yeah. that's just like, oh, I didn't mean to. It's Oops, just, I'm huge. <laughs> oh my I was god, I went to the gym one day. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite quotes is from Sean Stevenson. He says, uh, "Lifting weights doesn't make you big and bulky. Uh, chocolate croissants make you big and bulky." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing too about food that people don't understand. I know with all these new diets going around, you know, don't eat carbs, stay away from fats. You have to eat to lose weight and you have to eat to gain weight. Like losing weight doesn't mean starving yourself. You need to be eating carbs and proteins and fats in order to lose weight. We just want to get them from the right sources. And, and right. what I focus the most on is the, what are the hormonal replications of what's going to happen right. when you eat these foods? I don't, I don't even coach macros anymore. I'm, I'm just strictly, how, how is this going to affect you hormonally? Uh, what's the source? Okay. I mean, typically people see some pretty dramatic changes over time. Yeah, that's pretty much where, where my journey went when I became vegan. It became less about numbers and it was more what nutrients am I getting from everything that I'm eating? Walk us through how you started off with, with weight training. Like, what was the first couple workouts like? I remember working out with a girl that also worked at Lifetime with me. And we would just, you know how the machines are lined up at Lifetime with, yep. like... The leg aisle, the Yeah, aisle. yeah, yeah, arm aisle. So we'd be like, oh, we're doing arms and just go through the machines. You know, <laughs> we had no idea what we were doing, how many reps we should do, how many sets we should do. We were just like all right, we're working out. We're doing arms. We're doing this machine. And I remember people coming up and asking me like, well, what are you doing today? I'm like arms. They're like, okay, but what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know that, that machine. <laughs> so it really just took a lot of researching and watching videos on weight training and talking to people about weight training. And then I learned how you set up a workout and what workouts you should be doing for certain body parts. And right. As opposed to just randomly hitting stuff. Right. So that's probably one of the benefits of being part of a fitness club as opposed to just working out in your garage is, is you can feed off of other people's ideas and, yep. and collect information. Absolutely. I, I'm very happy with my time at Lifetime. It has taught me so much nutritionally, yeah. weight training wise. And then how did you progress from machines randomly to in the squat rack throwing down? Oh, man. You know, you just got to do it. You Build up this courage after you've been in the gym for a while. Yeah. I remember I would watch videos on how to do it, like look up videos on form and everything. I would talk to, I started dating a personal trainer and he would help me with That's it. That's helpful. Yeah, I, I was definitely fortunate for that. One. Was it easy for you to be receptive? Because like anybody I've dated, like they have no interest in training. I'm like, I'm a hundred bucks an hour. You can have it for free. And they're like, no, I don't want to train. Honestly, no. I hated working out with him. <laughs> like I was like, don't tell me what to do. I got this. I know how to work out. I guess it was just me being stubborn. There would be some days that we would have really good workouts together, but I definitely wasn't as receptive. And did you start to branch off to kind of what fit your likes and what your body wanted? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I love, I started getting like shoulders and I was like, oh, I'm just going to do arms all the time. Shoulders, <laughs> back, all of it. Like, I love this. Yeah. And I would cut back on legs for a while. What's your least favorite and your favorite exercises? <sighs> well, I hate cardio and I really hate, ab workouts yeah yeah oh abs are my favorite oh, i have never enjoyed them i absolutely hate it i've never abs. had <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah not my favorite honestly shoulders is probably one of my favorite things to train there's just so much you can do with that one small body part like legs obviously you have so many different parts of your legs that you can work out but like shoulders i just really enjoy focusing on that What's cool about the shoulders is is it is a smaller muscle, but you can see definition changes pretty quickly, which right. I think is really mo motivating for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, then you got the front side and rear delt, so mm -hmm. it gives you all kinds of options and different ways to move. Right. If you could pick one exercise to do the rest of your life because you think it's the most important, what would you pick? <sighs> one exercise. I would probably do deadlifts, actually. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's my choice. Because it'll hit. So many things. Everything. Yeah. If you yeah. could only do one, that's one that will benefit lots of parts of your body. Have you had any injuries working out? I haven't had any injuries from working out, but I do have previous injuries that I have to work around. I was in a really bad car accident when I was 16 or 17 and messed up my spine. So I can't do anything with like a bar on my back. I can't do back squats. I can't put pressure on that part of my neck. So... That got me really good at front squats, yeah. which a lot of people don't do. I'll be doing front squats and people are like, whoa, yeah. you, 
why do you do that? I'm like, well, I really don't have another option if I want to lift yeah. like heavy squats. I can do like goblet squats and stuff. I have really poor dexterity, so I won't do the front squat because so much of my energy and effort is my arms. Just, yeah, holding them up. And that's not even the intended target. Right. But I'll do it with dumbbells. I'll do front squats with dumbbells. Okay, yeah. But I think that's an important point because everybody has injuries and a lot of people say, well, why well, can't work out? Right. Uh, but there's always a way to work around it. I know Jeff Cavalier is a big proponent of even if it's partial range of motion, do what you can do. Right. Because uh, especially with mobility, it really is use it or lose it. Uh, so I think it's encouraging to some of our listeners to know, even with those cervical injuries, you can safely and in a healthy way work around them and still get strong and still get fit. Yeah. And it took me a while to learn too. I would be stubborn for a little while and I'm like, well, back squats, that's what you do. You know, you have to do squats. And then I would just be in so much pain and I started caring about my actual health. And I was like, I can't do this to myself. I can work around this and still get just as good a workout. And if a barbell doesn't work, go to dumbbells. You can right. separate, you can rotate things out of impingement zones. I think it's hard to, to like get out of the mentality of, I have to do what everyone does to look fit. Like there's nothing wrong with using dumbbells. You don't look weak because you're using dumbbells instead of being in the squat rack. I had to learn that to like get out of my own ego, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard for a lot of guys. And sometimes people, even when it comes to barbell stuff, is they're embarrassed to only have the 10 pounders on there. Right. But you got to start somewhere and you yeah. do it with perfect form. Um, and then you can add a little bit and a little bit. So I know at times I would struggle with, especially if I had like frozen shoulder or something, here I am with dumbbells and, and this doesn't look very masculine. Yeah. As I learned more and more about strength training, I started cutting the weight back and just focusing on perfect form. Yep. Um, I did and, the same thing. And the the muscle growth from those lighter weights with perfect form was astounding. Uh, it was much faster than when I was just trying to go as heavy as I can and end yeah. up with all kinds of crazy things happening. Yeah, it's definitely a big misconception. Lifting heavier won't make you stronger or manlier. If you're doing it wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're just going to hurt your back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, then end up with a walker or something. Yeah. So... Uh, now tell us a little bit about what's some of your personal drive and motivation towards keeping a healthier body and keeping up with, with the work in the gym. I have become obsessed with my inner health ever since the whole thing with acne. I've just learned so much about food that I only want to put good things in my body. I love eating good foods. Like it, it really, you, you become happy with eating healthy foods when you do it for so long and it just makes you feel so much better. And in the gym, I mean, there's nothing like meeting a new goal when you can do something that you couldn't do before or you see the changes in your muscles and you feel stronger. Like I'll, I'll have days where I just have such a good lift that like, you know, you just want to go back. I'm like, I want to go yeah. do that again. Yeah, absolutely. It's really just for like self-growth. I just, I, I love it. For a lot of people, I think strength training can almost even be uh, meditative. Uh, just like yoga or even literally meditating. Yeah. It's a chance to kind of tune everything out, focus on yourself. Yeah, especially if you're doing heavy lifts, you can't think about anything else. Right. You got to be um, one track mind. Yeah, it's incredible stress relief, I think. I um, agree. One of the things, Brandon, you talked about on the last microbiome episode was about how you have these, and I'll say it wrong because I don't know as much as you do, but these these bacteria in your gut that if you feed them a lot of sugar, then they want more sugar and they make it harder to say no. And you were talking about how after you're eating healthier now, now you kind of crave healthy foods. Yep. I'm curious, how long did it take of eating healthier before you started to crave healthier foods versus like Snickers? Right. Um, <laughs> It might have been a couple months of like, maybe not even that long, maybe like a month of just like eating so clean that I was feeling better in the gym. I was feeling better in my life. I like would wake up not tired ever. I had so much energy. And then I'm like, okay, I, why have I not been doing this this whole time? Yeah. I don't think it takes a very long time yeah. to, to feel those changes. We were talking about this. My wife and I went on a date last night and it's very difficult to eat clean at a restaurant. It's like, yeah. can you even? You know, yes. there's nothing on the menu that represents something that you is not a member of the standard American diet. Right. And that's pretty tough. You know, when eating out, I try and encourage find a non-fried protein. If it comes in a cream sauce, you could always ask for a different preparation if you're trying to avoid dairy. You could always go with a sweet potato. Maybe don't add 50 things to it, but the sweet potatoes are pretty good on their own. And then uh, you could always swap out your fried okra for some sort of sauteed veggie. Now, it'll probably still end up with a vegetable oil or something that's not great for you. So there's always uh, at least eating better. I, always, I think it's tough to eat perfect at a restaurant, but you can always eat better. 
I mean, that's what I would shoot for. Uh, so instead of getting like fried chicken, maybe I'll get grilled chicken. And if I get a salad, they'll probably still use a vegetable oil dressing. So if it's available, I'll say, hey, do you guys have olive oil and vinegar you can bring out? And most places can, can accommodate that. And if not, sometimes I just won't do a dressing. Or if, if you just gag at that thought, just put <laughs> the damn dressing on. At least you're not eating fried chicken. <laughs> so it's still eating better. You're getting fiber. You're getting vegetables and things like that. Now, the microbiome does change over time as different bacterial species grow, so your tastes can change. Uh, taste buds actually flip over every two weeks, supposedly. I heard that factoid once. But based on the different types of bacteria and colonizations you have in your gut, you do prefer different foods. And especially like kids overcoming picky eating, we would have them try the exact same food, just one bite every day for two weeks. And by the end of the two weeks, then they can make that judgment call whether or not they actually like it or not. Wow. Because as those bacteria change, your body's going to crave. Because remember, there's more neurons in your gut than in your brain. And those bacterial species interact with that, and they do have a say in what your tastes are, uh, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, I noticed that after I went vegan, there were so many foods that I absolutely despised before, like certain types of vegetables. I was never a fan of coconut that now I can't imagine not eating those things. I still have a hard time with sprouts. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the sprouts. Some of them just taste so earthy. They taste like they came straight out of the ground. Yeah. Some you can find that are they're good. I had radish sprouts once, and I'll never do that again. Oh, I don't my think gosh. I've ever had that. I do broccoli sprouts usually. Yeah, they're probably not too bad. No, they're pretty um, good. Are sprouts just smaller? They're like the veal of vegetables? <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually know. Are they, do they come from a bean? I don't know. It's from the seed. The seeds? Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. sprouted. That's awesome. Now, when you go shopping for food now, how do you avoid a lot of the garbage? I've actually really found that since I became vegan, grocery shopping is so easy. I just buy produce. Like I buy fruits, veggies, roots. I always have ginger on hand. I always have turmeric on hand. I always have oats on hand and beans and lentils. The only stuff that I've ever found is like expensive is if you buy like one of the lentil pastas I like is a little expensive, but yeah. I really just, I just don't let myself buy bad foods. Like I go straight for the produce. I know I need beans. I know I need some sort of sauce. I, and I read ingredients on everything. And, the, and then it becomes pretty automatic with the spot. Like it seems overwhelming at first, yep. but but you can crash through an entire list. And, and really, if you're eating healthy stuff, it shouldn't have 50 million ingredients anyway. Right. Uh, what are some of the ingredients you avoid? I won't eat anything that has canola oil in it. Anything with sugar, any sort of processed sugar, I won't eat it. Honestly, if I look at an ingredient label and I don't know every single word on there, I won't buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I'll, sometimes I'll Google something, uh, like while I'm standing there in the store, mm -hmm. just, just if I'm not sure what it is. And half the time it's okay, half the time it's not. But right. I don't have time to do that all the time. But the nice thing is once I do it, I know what that word is. I usually won't buy stuff that has natural flavor on there either. Yeah, that's a loophole in, in legislation. They don't have to disclose what that natural flavor is. Typically, right. it's a sugar. Yeah, so I won't buy that just because you don't know what's in there. The biggest struggle with vegan eaters is how to get in enough protein without um, their carbohydrate intake going through the roof. Yeah. What, what are some of your workarounds with that? Yeah, I still do a protein shake for one of my, my snacks. So that will give me a good 40 grams of protein a day. I usually shoot for about 100, and I just... I get my protein from beans, lentils, seeds. If I eat almonds, I'll get good protein from that. And that'll take my fats up a little. I really plan my food out the morning of before I eat it to make sure that like everything balances out. So if I'm having a lot of beans to get my protein, I won't eat oatmeal in the morning. You know, I'll make like a yogurt or something. Okay. A vegan yogurt. Like a coconut <laughs> yogurt? Yeah. Something like that. Um, now, how do you make uh, yogurt? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't mean make it. I just I oh, have just like a, it, yeah. yeah, like some plain yogurt. I'll put fruit in it or seeds, yeah. whatever. So, so you can buy cultures and you can make your own yogurt. I'm not, yeah. I'm way too lazy for that, but. I am as well. <laughs> I can't imagine doing that. Yeah. There's like a homebrew style community that just make their own yogurt. They put it in a little jar, share it with their friends. There you my, go. <laughs> my mom did that with kombucha. She used to like make her own kombucha cultures, the little scobies. Yeah, yeah. And brew her own kombucha. Mm, that's fun. It's a lot of work. I tried one after you t you talked about kombucha. I was at Wegmans and I bought the one that you said, the cayenne... Ginger? Ginger, yep. How was that? I liked it. Yeah, that's I good was surprised stuff. to see on the label uh, that it had a small amount of alcohol in there, but that made sense. Yeah, right. very, very small. I mean, you probably have to down I, like a gallon to feel a bug. Yeah, I'm a big fan of kombucha. I love those. Yeah, yeah. I like the tribucha. I like um, 
Bucci out of Asheville. Oh, okay. that's a really good one. Wegman um, had their own brand. Cavita. Oh, did they? Yeah, their own brand of they like five or six different flavors, wow. and it was only two dollars and fifty cents for a bottle. That's oh not, wow, seemed pretty affordable for. Yeah, and then Aldi's got a bunch. They got like an apple mint one, a mango something. There, that's good stuff. I love, love it. That. Yeah, and th- and then if you're a soda drinker, maybe that's a good segue into something else. That's how I got my mom into kombucha. Oh yeah. Yep. Good stuff. That and Zevia. I always like to plug uh, Zevia. I do love Zevias. My only caution would be is if you're really sensitive to stevia, it could cause either diarrhea or headaches and to do a lot. Now, do you have a couple of stores that you frequent uh, for, for meal prep, grocery shopping, and things like that? I use Costco for produce just because yeah. I buy a lot of stuff in bulk. I juice a lot. Whole Foods is my go-to for, like, if I'm looking for something specific to like veganism, like that lentil pasta that I really like, I'll yeah. go to Whole Foods for it. But other than that, I can go to really any grocery store. Oh. So Harris Cedar, Whole Foods, and Costco are probably my three that I do. Yeah, yeah, I'm similar. I'll di- most of the produce I can't from Aldi because they're pretty cheap. Yes. Uh, what I can't find there, I'll go to Harris Teeter. Yep. And then my specialty items, either Weaver Street Market or, or Whole Foods. Yeah, that's um, exactly how I am. Costco, Harris Teeter, Whole Foods. Yeah. yeah, so there's ways to make it affordable. And if there's just a few specialty items that you need, then you can go to those other stores. Right. Now, tell us a little bit about your activism for women's rights. What are some of the issues you see and what changes would you like to see? How do we get there? Oh, God. There's so many places to start. My biggest issue that I'm tackling day to day lately is toxic masculinity. You see a lot of it in the gym. It doesn't mean you're bad because you're a man. It's when you have this idea of masculinity that anything feminine is bad or wrong. I use this example with a guy the other day. He he was like, well, just just because I like trucks doesn't mean I'm a bad person. I'm like, there's, it has nothing to do with it. I'm saying if you wouldn't drive a car because it's girly, that's an issue. Like cars aren't girly. You know what I mean? (laughs) Cars are, cars are a car. If you don't like red wine, that's totally fine. I don't care what you like. If you won't drink wine because it's a girly drink, that's toxic masculinity because you're afraid of anything that could make you be perceived as feminine, which you see a lot of in the gym with these bros so uh, what do you think some of the negative implications are of that type of thinking and behavior? It really just shows that you have this idea in your head that women are bad, that femininity is bad, that anything that could make you be seen as feminine is bad, which it, it shows how you feel about women. You think like girliness is bad. You think, or, or almost a superiority complex type right, thing. Right. People should be able to like whatever they like. Uh, drinks aren't feminine or masculine. You know, cars aren't feminine or masculine. I'm in a human sexuality class at school right now. And one of the girls in my class, she talks about her kids and she's like, I don't want my son to like want to paint his nails or something because that is just so inappropriate. He's a little boy that he's probably just artistic and wants to express like some creativity. People push these feminine and masculine roles on people for no reason, like things that shouldn't matter all of a sudden matter because you you make it matter like and I don't see the opposite with girls when girls are like tomboys and things no one has an issue with it I used to play in the dirt I used to play with dump trucks no one has a problem with that but it's if a boy wants to play with a doll and that starts that toxic masculinity at such a young age so I guess it could stifle kind of you know who they are or it can create these issues where um, they're afraid to express themselves which could build up anxiety and all kinds of issues absolutely lead uh, you to so much depression you won't realize who you are until much later on in life when you can finally be comfortable with who you are and I know that sounds crazy that I'm like here for women rights and I'm talking about men but that is yeah about femininity and it just shows how like we as a culture view women and view things as girly and how that's bad. So you like more of kind of like an egalitarian type where it's an equal playing field. Right. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. And I hate that too. When people hear the word feminist, they're like, oh, so you, you just hate men and you, you want women to have more rights. That's not what it is at all. Every, everyone should be a feminist. Everyone should want everyone to be equal. That doesn't mean women are better in any way. There, there's actually a series of t-shirts now that men are wearing guys with b- big burly men with beards. And it says, this is what a feminist looks like. Yes. Yeah, that's kind of funny. I love that. I don't know much about it. That I, I have heard the term toxic masculinity before and was curious to know what it meant, but having not studied it or anything, one of the things that I think that it would help with is that that is the kind of stuff that 
guys tease each other for. It seems like it's the platform for bullying. And I'm thinking like younger kids. Absolutely. You know, like your middle school age, your elementary school age. There is this kind of anything and everything is fair game to kind of put somebody down. And let's say that a, a, a guy had characteristics that weren't super masculine, then right. they would get picked on a lot more than somebody that didn't have those same characteristics. And I remember thinking even at a young age, well, that doesn't seem fair. It's just so ridiculous. And it just, like I said, it shows that you view women as bad for you to see someone that doesn't look as masculine or they look a little more feminine. You're like, well, that's bad. Yeah. So, so I guess another example would be, let's say a, a man wants to be an interior designer. You know, he could be teased and pressured a lot um, in social settings. Well, what do you do? I'm an interior designer. And then they, oh, well, you must be gay. Right. <laughs> Not necessarily. It's just crazy um, to me that normal things have these labels on them, like a job. A job is girly or manly. That's just so silly. Like yeah. a hobby, a job, cars, a whatever drink. you like. A drink. A beverage. Yeah, it's so <laughs> silly. And it's something to like pick on people for. Yeah. It's like an apple martini, right? <laughs> yeah. What's wrong? It's a delicious drink. It's a delicious drink. <laughs> well, that makes a lot of sense. What are some steps you think that anybody could take to, to help with that issue? I try to call people out on it when I see it and not in an aggressive way. Just making it a conversation. So like you said, you didn't know what that means. And you've seen it a lot in daily life and just didn't really have a term to put it to. So whenever I see it, I'll say, why do you think that's girly? And just make it a conversation. I'm not like, hey, shut up. You're being toxic right now. I would never do that to someone. But I don't think it go over well. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> no, but just talking to them and being like, why do you feel this way? And then a lot of people will go, huh, I don't know. Like, I've just always have been this way or I've always thought this way. Yeah. Yeah. I think about it like the way that people used to call somebody gay as a derogatory term. But now it's like you would never think to consider. And I think maybe this is another area where we've got some growth to do as yeah. a society. Yeah. Well, a personal example, I grew up, my favorite artist was Elton John. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't even know he was gay. And, and when people found out, my friends, they teased me mercilessly. Ah, you're gay. You like Elton John. But that's what started me into a music career. I ended up being a band director for four years and studying and writing music because of uh, that influence from Elton John. Luckily, my parents were supportive of that. But right. what if I grew up in a home where I didn't? I never would have been stifled or who knows. What yeah. And that's so, what I mean when yeah. it starts at such a young age and that will lead It'll change your whole life. It'll make yeah. you depressed or anxious throughout your life. You'll end up in a career you never wanted to do. Yeah. Or you'll figure it out later in life what you actually like and what you actually want to do and you've wasted all this time. I think it's something that just needs to become a conversation and not an accusatory conversation, not not an argument. Yeah, like, I think communication is good. Things tend to go a little bit better when there's more of that. Right. Yeah. Switching gears, do you have any particular moment in your life where you feel like you underwent kind of a transformation? Yeah, honestly, my as soon as I decided to cut out dairy, that really started my whole journey towards veganism and towards gut health. It changed my whole view on health, whereas I was such a bro in the gym and I was focused on numbers and just lifting and I kind of just wanted to start fresh. So I just stopped thinking all of the things that I had learned from the gym culture that I was in. And I started focusing on actual health, nutrition, ingredients, not just numbers, the nutrients that I'm putting in my body to fuel me for workouts. And that has completely changed everything about my health regimen. My workouts are different now. My diet's completely different. My skin is incredible now. Like yeah. It changed so many things in my life. Now, the funny thing about prescribing the uh, Accutane and the antibiotics for the acne is it temporarily goes away and then it comes back worse yep. because you continue to wipe out your microbiome health again and again and again because it, it doesn't discriminate. It just takes the good guys and the bad guys. Yeah. Early onset of that leads to some, some autoimmune issues, could even contribute to Crohn's disease which we talked about a little bit on the last episode. What would you say to somebody who's dealing with cystic acne and their doctor is insisting on, on something like Accutane? Do your research. I mean, if it's something that you really want to do and you think is good for you, you need to look it up yourself. I try to avoid antibiotics at all costs if I can because it will destroy your microbiome. It'll really affect everything about your gut. But look inwardly on what could be causing your cystic acne. Like look at what you're eating, 
look at your stress levels, look at maybe it's the birth control you're taking. It could be so many yeah. things and Accutane won't change the birth control you're taking. Now, are there any health shortcuts you've taken in the past that you wish you hadn't? Probably the whey protein is my biggest, <laughs> my biggest health issue was using yeah. that for like three meals a day yeah, so just the, if I, to hit my numbers. So the follow-up question you probably just answered is, um, you know, if, if you could tell your former self something that you know now, so we know that not to do the whey protein would right. be one. What are some other things that you wish you'd have done differently? Look at the food that you're eating. At the time I was just like, I need to hit these numbers. So I'm just going to eat what fits. So I would just be eating plain chicken and rice, maybe some broccoli here and there. Look at what you're putting in your body. You need more than rice and chicken. You need vegetables. <laughs> you need all of these other nutrients. Uh, so your, your microbiome is severely lacking if that's it. And then also if you have the same foods again and again and again without any kind of uh, variety, your body actually can create an autoimmune response to those foods. It'll yeah. shut down uh, nutrient receptors to those same combos. Wow. So it could even cause you to have reactions and things to things that you eat all the time. I think variety is really important for a lot of people. I'm curious, what would you guys say to people who are counting calories, doing those plans that are just counting numbers? Because that is the traditional operating system that most people think is the correct way to do it. And I feel like having sit in this podcast and doing some research on my own, now realizing that, oh, that's actually not going to work. Even in talking to somebody, you feel like that a crazy person. You're like, oh, I don't count calories. You like, you like say, I don't, I don't really count calories. And you're like, yeah, whatever. So what I would say is I do think there is some value to that uh, to just to kind of understand, um, you know, portion control and what's in food, but it's not the most important thing. There is value to it. You know, I'd recommend somebody maybe try it for two weeks. I just don't think it's a sustainable method for the rest of your life. Right. I mean, if you're getting ready for a bodybuilding competition, I think it's necessary. But if you're trying to increase your, your hormonal health and, and to lose some weight and things like that, I can't foresee calculating macros and trying to get this huge math equation right. You're just going to hate eating yeah. in general and go, screw it. I'm going to go eat a Twinkie. Yeah. Right. People that are just kind of religiously counting calories or trying to limit the amount of intake for a small amount of time so that they can lose weight. And oftentimes what happens is whenever they get off of that restriction, then they find themselves in more trouble than they started with. So I think the most important uh, thing to consider there is not uh, if we're just looking at calories and macros alone and we're not considering the content quality of the food and hormonal implications, that's where they get in trouble. Do things like Jenny Craig and stuff, do they care about that or is it points and the point is a point? So that's what I was talking about when I was saying that I was just focused on numbers and I wasn't focused on actual food at all. I think like Brandon says, tracking your macros can be really beneficial, especially for someone who is just starting any sort of nutrition journey at all to see how much they are eating or how much they aren't eating for them to have like a baseline to see, oh my God, I've only been eating 300 <laughs> calories a day. Yeah. And it's all carbs. <laughs> or I've been eating 4,000 calories a day in carbs and I should not be eating that much. So I think it's a good baseline, but it's not sustainable for your whole life. What you really need to focus on is what you're eating. I would have a hundred carbs left in my day and be like, oh, sweet. I can go and get like a cupcake. And that would fill my numbers, but it wasn't good for me. When you're tracking your macros, you need to be looking at the quality of the food that you're getting those macros from. Because you could eat a, a whole pizza and that will fit your numbers. It's not going to help you with your health or help you lose weight. And just, just for fun, let's let's break that apart. So we know that the cheese can cause acne. Right. Uh, we know that the wheat grain and corn in the crust is going to do all kinds of stuff to your gut and your brain yep. health and cause insulin issues. And, mm -hmm. and then we can go on through each ingredient. The but oil and the fat, yeah. You hit your calorie goals, but what did you just do to your body? But I just think there needs to be more emphasis and focus on, the like you said, the, the quality and content and not just the numbers. Now, if you want to still track calories and macros, just make sure you do more in-depth research as to how the food you're eating affect you. All right, Lily, the last thing I like to ask our guests is if you were to pick the top three things for somebody that wants to make a either mental or physical health transformation, what are the three steps you would recommend? Okay, I would say think of a goal, like picture where you want to be, what your ultimate health goal is or mental health goal is like maybe you have anxiety and you really want to lessen your anxiety. Maybe you need to lose weight. Maybe that's your goal. And then think why you're doing that. 
how will this improve your life? And then do your research on doing it. Like, don't just fall into fad diets. Like, I want to lose weight. I'm going to do keto. Like, look up research for yourself specifically to get yourself in the right headspace to actually do it right and do it correctly, whatever that goal may be. Like, if your anxiety is coming from a specific place and you want to help that, like, you know, go to therapy. You need to look at those three things, like what you want, why, and like you specifically how you can do that for you because there's not a one size fits all for anything. Yeah. I think having an expert in that field, if you, if you have the, the means and resources can, can make a big difference. Absolutely. And that can cut out a lot of dead research time to, to get you more focused and, and closer to where you need to be. Yeah. Right. What would the second thing be? Surround yourself with those kinds of people that are in the same mindset. I've had friends that I had to cut out of my life because I was really focused on health and like bettering myself and they wanted to drink and we're just going down not the same path. So put yourself in a, in a healthy environment for those changes that you want to make in your life. And third, I would say, don't be so hard on yourself. Like it's not going to be quick. Whatever the change you want to make is it's not going to be instant. It's going to take work. You have to commit to it, but it's hard. You know, it's not, you don't just go to the gym and lose weight. You don't just learn nutrition in a day and know what works for your body. Like, Give yourself a break. Don't be so hard on yourself, but stick to it. So many people start something, and as soon as they make a mistake, they go, ah, screw it. I'll start next week. Yeah, can't Um, do it. But understanding, hey, you did 96 other things correct. Right. um, So you messed up. This thing is fine. Whatever. Recover. Right. And go back to it. Giving yourself that grace um, and understanding there's a learning curve and it's going to take time is is one of the most important things. And that starts with setting reasonable goals. Awesome. I think that's it for today's episode. But thanks for coming on the show Thank and you sharing your, your experience and being vulnerable. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's episode. If you did, uh, go check us out at firewithinnf.com. You can subscribe to our newsletters and make sure you never miss an episode or any other content. Also, be sure to follow us on social media.